that's cool with you. Yeah, no, I so welcome everybody for um, this uh, second um, archaeology lecture in uh, the RAG seminar series um, from Graham Warren, who's professor at uh, University College Dublin in, in the School of Archaeology. Um, and Graham is um, asking the question, is there such a thing as hunter-gatherer archaeology? A very broad and sweeping question that we're very excited to hear about. Um, Graham is currently involved in, uh, hopefully going to be busy involved in, in uh, organizing the Conference of Hunters and Gatherers next year in Dublin. We all hope it's going to be in the flesh. Um, and it's also worth mentioning that he is starting up a master's um, in hunter-gatherer archaeology. Uh, so presumably this is uh, uh, an area with a future. So over to you, Graham. Thank you very much indeed, Camilla, and thank you very much, Chris, and uh, the Radical Anthropology Group as a whole for the, for the invitation this evening. And, and thank you to so many of you for, for coming along. This is, this is a, a question that I found useful to think about. I'm not wholly convinced I fully agree with my own answer at this stage. But I, I, in, in presenting this paper, um, I, I found the, the process of, of laying out this question to be, to be quite useful. And it seems that some others have, have found this useful as well, even if, they, even if they disagree quite profoundly with me. So I, I hope to be talking for perhaps 45 or, or 50 minutes and then have lots of space for, for discussion at the end. And I really do look forward to, to that discussion. I think that's, the, that's why I've, in, I've enjoyed writing this paper to try and, to try and promote these sorts of things. So there, there's a, tell you what, why don't I show you some pictures? That would be a good idea. Can, can you see the screen now? Yes. Brilliant. I should have, I should have done that first off. So um, there's a, a, a sort of all papers have a have a different story of their of their genesis and their development. And this and I'll, I'll say something in the in the substance of the paper in a minute. This really arose as a very as a very personal question in response to some changing professional um, circumstances. And it was it was formalised through um, an invitation by my friend and colleague Bill Finlayson to contribute to a special issue of the um, journal Heritage, a special issue that's devoted to the subject of hunter-gatherer um, archaeology. And I've presented uh, previous versions of this paper at, a, at an ISHCA meeting, the International Society of Hunter-Gatherer Research, in January of this year, and last month to the University of Western Australia. And that's allowed me to, to develop parts of the discussion. And as we were just, just talking about earlier, actually the different responses from different audiences around the world has been, has been really, really interesting. Um, and, the, and I think that that sense of different responses, one of the, the most fundamental backgrounds to this is that this paper has developed from my involvement with the International Society of Hunter Gatherer Research, where I've been lucky enough to serve on their board, to play a, a, a role in editing their journal, and to be hosting the next CHAGS meeting in June 2022 in, in Dublin. And that really has um, broadened my horizons as to what hunter gatherer research might be, how hunter gatherer research is, is practiced in different places, and fundamentally made me realize that my my own background in terms of working on primarily on the Mesolithic of Northwestern Europe, that the, the sorts of archaeology that focus on hunter gatherers in those regions are very, very strange in global context. They're, they're quite weird. And as I'll try and point out, I actually think they're rather impoverished compared to many other traditions of hunter gatherer, of archaeological hunter gatherer research and those were those were feelings i think that were borne out even more strongly for me watching the the meso 2020 conference in toulouse last year the organizers did a did a fantastic job in providing a platform for us to, to share our research and ideas um in in the midst of a pandemic but the nature of the research that was that was presented i found i found less than compelling so this is a a, a personal take on asking this this question which i which is i hope of, of broader interest. The, the paper has now been submitted to, to Heritage and has been accepted for, for publication. I've got a chance to do a couple of, of very minor revisions now, but hopefully this will be out as an open access paper soon. So if you, if you find it of value, perhaps it's something that you'd be able to, you'd be able to share with people. Okay, 
I start with um, an image that I drew when I was seven or eight years old in 1980 or 1981. And those of you good at mathematics will now be able to work out how old I am. It's a, it's a piece done at John Rankin Junior School, a junior school in the town of Newbury in the, in the south of England. I'm very grateful to my parents for, for keeping this. It wasn't always obvious that my path would lead me to, to hunter-gatherer archaeology. And, and I, I show this image not to, not to highlight anything about particular artistic ability or about strategies that people may have used in hunting elephants, although I believe that Jerome Lewis might have some comments to make about the particular approaches being used here. But I put this here to, to highlight the power and the influence of the idea of our hunter-gatherer past. It's quite clear here, although we, the word hunter-gatherer isn't used, it's quite clear here that our young class were being formally instructed about aspects of human evolution. There's, there's other drawings and pages from the, from the same time period about the processes of change in our deep time past. And, and you can see here this emphasis on humans having brains and tools that set them apart from, from others. That this is, this is central to our process of change. And this, of course, is, is really an example of what you can, what you can call the co-production of knowledge. Our knowledge of hunter-gatherers past is, is in part based on the archaeological remains that we, that we excavate and interpret and understand, but it's also caught up in much broader discourses. In, in this instance, lots of ideas about hunter-gatherers powerfully reiterated through the pedagogy of education, an education aimed at, aimed at comparatively young children. And I realized recently that for a series of um, you know, developments in my professional career that in truth, for most of the last 20 years, what I've been doing is continuing to co-produce the idea of hunter-gatherers and hunter-gatherer archeology, span to produce the idea that there is something distinctive about hunter-gatherers and that there may be something distinctive about hunter-gatherer archeology. span Over recent years and then through working with Ishka, I've increasingly tended to define myself not as a, as a Mesolithic specialist, which, which I would have done in the past, but as a hunter-gatherer specialist whose special, whose special interest, whose geographical focus just happens to be prehistoric Northwest Europe. Within Ishka, and Ishka I think is a fantastic organization, but Ishka is to large extent dominated by social and cultural anthropology. I've often been a voice for increased archaeological engagement, and I'm a, a voice for that for the next Chags meeting in Dublin. And last year, and as Camilla mentioned, um, we got approval from UCD to run a new master's and graduate diploma course in hunter-gatherer archaeology, which has its first intake in September 2021. So all of these actions would, would suggest that I knew and that I was confident about what exactly hunter-gatherer archaeology was, that what might make hunter-gatherer archaeology different than other types of archaeology, and that given that I I know, and we'll, we'll explore this in a minute, I know that there's a problematic background to the term hunter-gatherers, to that concept. Knowing that there's a problematic background there, how can we continue to justify talking about hunter-gatherer archaeology? And this paper really is an attempt to, to unpick those issues. So we can turn to, to some of the reviews that are out there in the literature um, at the moment. And there's a couple of examples from recent encyclopedias of the social sciences or encyclopedias of archaeology. So these are short papers and the authors don't get a chance to, to really unpack all aspects of this definition. So Anna Prentice, um, in a really useful paper, points out that you know, achieving a comprehensive understanding of past hunter-gatherers will require knowledge beyond the standard training received by many archaeologists. So hunter-gatherer archaeologists can feel good about ourselves in this, that what we're doing is beyond what those pesky classical archaeologists or post-medieval archaeologists, they have it easy. We, we have something more challenging to do. Um, Vivian Scheinshorn, um, in a slightly different definition, talks about this as being very different from what you see in the media. It can be very basic and straightforward. And, and I think what's implied here is that the nature of the materials that hunter-gatherer archaeologists deal with is sometimes much more basic than perhaps other other periods. But these are these are the kinds of statements that are here. They're, they're saying that hunter-gatherer archaeology is different in some ways. But as I say, in, in short reviews and without being able to, to expand on these fields very much, I, I didn't find these arguments compelling to really understand why this type of archaeology might be different. 
so to try and explore this question, I want to I want to look at this through what, what I'm calling four prisms, and don't don't take that metaphor too seriously. Overall, so I'm going to ask these four questions and run through the run, and this really structures the argument. The first is that the the idea of hunter gatherers is a distinctive object for our discipline. Hunter gatherer archaeology is distinct because there is something different about hunter gatherers. The second is that hunter gatherer archaeology is carried out in the same way in different places. That globally there's some common practices relating to hunter gatherer archaeology. The third suggests that hunter gatherer archaeology is focusing on a distinctive suite of material record. That the the archaeological record of hunter gatherers, if you like, is different, consistently different than other groups or other periods. And finally, in terms of these prisms, it's suggesting that hunter gatherer archaeology might focus on different questions that aren't so characteristic of other types of archaeology. So I'm going to run through those, and then following that try and make a justification for, for my answer to this question of, of is there such a thing as hunter-gatherer archaeology. A couple of things, I, I to, be, before we look at the detail of this, a couple of caveats. I'm talking here, I'll say something about indigenous archaeology later, but I'm talking here about the archaeology of hunting and gathering groups, not archaeology as practiced by hunter-gatherers. I'm also restricting my argument almost exclusively to the um, archaeology of sapiens populations. Um, I don't have the expertise to be dealing I, to be dealing properly with how these arguments might work with pre-sapiens populations, but I think there's interesting points for points for discussion there. Um, it's a this is a verbal presentation. I'm going to be a little bit light on some of the detail of the examples, and I'm happy to pick up on on that in discussion. And finally, although I've I've, I've attempted to to pick examples from a range of different locations. Um, I'm linguistically rather limited, so my examples are rather anglophone. That, that, that's a bias in, in what I'm presenting. Running through all of this and, and underpinning the argument as a whole is that I think there is a, a fundamental difference between the practice of hunter-gatherer archaeology in colonized nations, and, and here I'm talking about the set of the colonization of the 17th, 18th, 19th century. So the archaeology of hunter-gatherers in colonized nations, especially where those displaced hunting and gathering groups, and the practice of hunter-gatherer archaeology in those that are colonizing. Nations. And I realize those are, that's a terrible simplification. Saying these things from Ireland, which is sometimes described as Europe's only post colonial country, saying that as an Englishman in Ireland, I, I recognize there's lots of complexity there, but I'm just making a, a very simple distinction at this level between the, the practice of archaeology in colonized nations as opposed to, to those who are not. And we've seen increasing interest recently in ideas about decolonizing the the deep time past. Martin Poor and Jacqueline Matthews' fantastic book on interrogating human origins is, I think, compelling reading for anyone with an interest in the, in the Paleolithic, really impressive in showing how the legacy of colonial thought colors and structures our understanding of, of these periods. But in other places, these questions have not been perhaps foregrounded in the way we might have expected in European archaeological practice. I'm uh, delighted to be organizing with my colleague um, and friend Ben Elliott from Newcastle University uh, a workshop on decolonizing the Mesolithic in a couple of weeks' time, which is our attempt to open up a space for these sorts of, these sorts of discussions. An indigenous archaeology has a, has a, a series of, of varied but reasonably well-defined um, aims, but one of the key of them, and one that I think is, is relevant in a context, in a European context where I practice my archaeology, where we're not really dealing with indigenous hunting and gathering groups or their direct descendants, one of the key issues that indigenous archaeology raises for us is the challenge of identifying and expunging the colonialist underpinnings of archaeology, the way that colonial categories and thoughts influence our practice and influence our interpretation. And as I say, that's going to that's gonna feed through this discussion overall. I'm running, running through a lot of this debate about indigenous archaeology and decolonizing is the idea that, that prior to undertaking any research activity, prior to trying to, to carry out a process of, of exploration, that what you would try and create is an ethical space to bring different participants and different stakeholders together and, and, and unpick these issues around epistemology, around the ethics of different research questions. And, and I suppose in part what I'm trying to do with this, with this question that I've set myself is to, to open an ethical space for my own practice 
to to give space to to reflect and consider the sorts of things that that I'm doing and the the preconceptions and the prejudices that I might bring to that. Okay, so let's think about our, our subject, the, the the first of these prisms. So returning here, my argument is to to try and understand whether there's any essential unity in the in the concept of hunter gatherers. Does this give unity to the practice of hunter gatherer archaeology? And and unfortunately, and as uh, as I think is widely recognised, this isn't this isn't the case. Researchers know and recognise that the idea of hunter gatherers derives from a, a particular social context. In particular, a series of um, social evolutionary models, idealized social evolutionary models that developed from the um, 18th century Scottish Enlightenment, transforming and, and building upon much older ideas about the links between subsistence and human society. And, and very significantly and importantly, those social evolutionary notions, those notions of hunter-gatherers, were an active enabler in processes of settler colonialism, settler colonialism and genocidal activities at all. So the, the concept has a profoundly difficult history in that sense. And as I say it, towards the end, the, the category, although it, its place has changed, the category continues to have enormous public power today to be, to be understood in a very wide variety of ways. In different contexts across the globe, the idea that uh, archaeological practice, anthropological practice would continue to use the idea of hunter-gatherers is met with a certain scepticism. Presenting this recently to, to an Australian audience, I very politely at the end of it in the discussion, I was effectively told, why the hell are you continuing to use this idea? It's just not something which was, was deemed to be acceptable or appropriate for, for a modern anthropological or archaeological practice in the global south. And, and Ian McNiven and Lynette Russell in 2005 were really, were really asking the same question. You know, why a category that's part of a progressivist typology? Why does this continue to be used in our practice today? So, and I think this is, although, although many researchers I think are aware of this, I don't know that we always engage substantively with the implications of this problem. I think there's lip service played to it, but I think this repays further critical attention. So the idea of hunter-gatherers is itself problematic. Accepting that, it, that it's problematic, does this idea of hunter-gatherers help us understand similarity and difference between, between human groups in the past? And, and again, it's long recognized that it doesn't necessarily do this. Just a couple of examples here. One is um, from the uh, so-called intensification debate of the 1980s in Australia. And here, there was a, a very long-standing recognition that the, the way in which societies were labeled in Papua New Guinea and Australia actually masked very similar historical processes in those two areas. So in Papua New Guinea, the communities there were understood as being horticulturalists, whereas in Australia, they were understood as being hunter-gatherers. But actually, the, the processes of change over time were very similar in the two areas, and what was pulling them apart analytically were the preconceptions that researchers brought to the idea of horticulturalists or hunter-gatherer societies. Another example of the, the problems with this label comes in looking at the transition to agriculture, whereas Bill Finlayson and, and many others have argued that the boundary def definitions that we use between hunting and gathering to and agriculture are very difficult to maintain. They shift and they move over time. And, and in effect, what we often do is, is introduce analytical modifiers to help, to help police those boundaries. So we talk about low level food production. We talk about complex hunter-gatherers, all of these extras that we bring in to, to protect our concepts. But the, the, the idea of hunter-gatherers doesn't always help us understand these patterns of similarity and difference. It's even quite difficult to define what exactly we mean by a, a, a hunter-gatherer. And again, if you look at the anthropological literature on this, it's widely recognized that the idea of hunter-gatherers contains enormous diversity even within the ethnographic present. And there's a variety of archeological reviews, Lempke amongst others, which, which argue very compellingly that we should expect even more diversity in the deep time archeological record of hunter-gatherers than we have in the, in the ethnographic present. And again, this is often manifest in various forms of, of subdivision that we bring to our study. So we might talk, for example, of immediate return hunter-gatherers or delayed return 
hunter-gatherers, trying to, trying to get a better handle on this diversity. The, the, the way that definitions of hunter-gatherers have, have worked anthropologically has, has changed over time, um, moving from um, initial definitions are based around subsistence through looking at social organization and, and worldview. And in a, in a very recent, in, in a very useful recent summary, Nurit uh, David suggests that we can best understand hunting-gathering societies and that their study as being linked by what are at best partially shared features. And that's a, that's a concept I want to come back to, this partially shared features. And she suggests that these are, these are hunter-gathering itself, the, the subsistence strategies, the organization of societies in bands, the, the importance of the social institution of sharing, and then issues around the, the giving environment or animism, relations with, with other groups, particularly neighboring um, agricultural communities, and hunter-gatherer ontologies. And, and I think it's worth just noticing here that these, these anthropological definitions, and, and we could have used a number of examples of these, they, they cover similar ground. It's interesting to note that these are, particularly as you get towards the bottom of the list here, these are increasingly challenged to operationalize archaeologically and much further away from what many archaeologists might be comfortable with dealing with. And I think it's, it's worth asking and being critically aware of the question of whether archaeological and anthropological definitions are actually the same. And if they're not, what the consequences of this are. And I think this is this is important because archaeological definitions of hunter-gatherers tend to be less well developed than the anthropological. In many cases, and I recognize this is a stereotypical statement, archaeological definitions are often based on subsistence. If we identify a hunting and gathering subsistence strategy, we've identified hunter-gatherers. And many other aspects of these definitions are then brought in by a series of analogies. Sometimes those analogies are explicit, but more often than not, they're implicit. And what we end up with, and, and many people have argued this, what we end up with is the recreation of a, of a fairly normalized man the hunter generalized foraging adaptation in the past. Okay, so finally, in terms of thinking about hunter gatherers, we've suggested in, as, as a subject, we've suggested that the, this is a concept with a dodgy history. It's a concept that doesn't necessarily allow us to understand similarity and difference very well. It's a concept that subsumes huge diversity overall. And even if we turn to, to what in some ways is, is something of an archaeological Bible about hunter gatherers, the, the, the foraging spectrum or the life ways of hunter gatherers by, by Bob Kelly. And Bob's a man who, who describes himself as a, a self-confessed dirt archaeologist. He, he, he likes, he, he likes the, the reality of archaeological practice in that sense. And he's written these fantastic books. Um, and in them, he says, there's nothing wrong with the term hunter gatherer, as long as we recognize it doesn't actually explain anything at all. It's only a heuristic. It's only of use in terms of pedagogy. Okay, so the first prism, I think, suggests that, that we cannot find unity for hunter-gatherer archaeology in the, in the idea of hunter-gatherers. So what happens if we, if we try and think about how hunter-gatherer archaeology is practiced in different places? Okay, so, so archaeology, strictly speaking, is, the, is often defined as the study of material culture. And in the, in the third prism here, I want to talk about the nature of the, of the archaeological record that may or may not characterize hunter-gatherers. But what I want to do in this prism is consider how archaeology sits alongside other sources of evidence for deep time hunter-gatherers and understand how those relationships work and how that shapes the nature of archaeological practice. And I'm going to present a, a really very, very simplified model to try and explore this. And what, and what I'm talking about here is, is direct evidence from different regions. So I'm not going to introduce into this discussion broader comparative models of general anthropological theory or general evolutionary theory. I'm talking about particular bodies of evidence from, from different places. And I'm also not ignoring the profound implication that different social economic contexts makes to practice. This is a, a very, very simplified model to prompt a little bit of thought. And I think there's, there's great need for further research on that social and economic context of our practice. And, and again, I, I think that what I'm about to say is actually really, really self-evident, but there's some value in making these issues explicit. Okay, so if you think about the key sources of direct evidence for, for past hunter-gatherer lives, I think there's probably five main 
main areas of this. Um, so we, we can, of course, think about material culture, and I'll say something more about that in a moment, but the, the image here is just a couple of examples of really beautiful polished slate points from maybe 4,500 BC from an assemblage I've been working on in Ireland, and they're just beautiful, gloriously lovely things, so it's a nice chance to, to put a photo of them there. But we also, obviously, in terms of past hunter-gatherers, we now draw on um, genetic evidence. Um, initially, this was often based on modern population genetics, but increasing use of ancient population genetics. And there's, a, there's been a complicated um, relationship between archaeology and ancient DNA work. Um, one really nice example of that is recent discussions of the early post-glacial colonization of northern Scandinavia. Um, and this is Tom Bjorklund's lovely picture here, um, reconstruction drawing showing aspects of that of that genetic diversity. But here there's been a move between archaeological accounts and genetic accounts, both of which are showing that there's migration along the Atlantic coast of Europe and from the um, from the far northwest of Russia, a kind of um, a, a boreal uh, a high, out, high latitude route. But the two subjects refining each other's discussions in terms of the chronology and the nature of those contexts. And the, and the best work that's coming out in terms of ancient DNA is where it's working closely with the archaeologists. In many areas of the world, understanding the deep time hunter-gatherer past can also draw on historical linguistics. And, and what I'm talking about here is the, the structure of language, linguistic borrowing from, from different, from different um, neighbors and, uh, and other language families. Um, and, and again, when this is done well, this provides incredible depth and incredible um, nuance to our understanding of the past. So um, Nicholas Burenholt's work on the long-term linguistic history of peninsular Southeast Asia is, the, is an example here, and you, you won't be able to see that example, the, the diagram properly there. But Burenholt argues that, that over time in this region, there is a stable foraging niche which has a particular language um, or language group associated with it, that over time different groups of people move in and out of that niche. The niche itself remains stable it has this stability in regard to its neighbors, but it's not occupied by any one particular group. But a, another great example of bringing together these different, these different sources of evidence. In many areas of the world, the study of the hunter-gatherer past can draw on ethno-historical sources, predominantly probably from the 18th, 19th century, and perhaps some very early anthropology. The um, example here are a series of illustrations from Russian leaders of um, indigenous artifacts from the Kodiak Islands in the in the North Pacific. And, and one example of the, the kinds of ways some of this archaeological practice might work would be Ben Fitzhugh's work on the evolution of complexity in the Kodiak Islands, where he's able to use with, with critical care and attention, and there's lots of issues about how we might use these sources, but with critical care and attention, he's able to use these sources almost as an end point for a narrative of long-term change over time. And, and it's undoubtedly the case, and accepting all the problems with those ethno-historical sources and the, the difficulties we have in picking our way through them, it's undoubtedly the case that practicing archaeology in an area where they exist is profoundly different than the challenges I might face in the Mesolithic of Europe, where there is no ethno-historical end source for how the hunter-gatherers turn up. And finally, in terms of these direct sources of evidence, in many parts of the world we have indigenous or oral tradition to inform us about the deep time past. And I think there's been a, a fairly profound shift in archaeological um, understandings of the potential significance and the potential reliability of these sources. And again, I'll, I'll say something more about indigenous archaeology in just a moment. But the illustration here is from Patrick Nunn's work on the memories of sea level change in Holocene Australia that were preserved in oral tradition. And, and if I remember correctly, but perhaps the oldest of these going back over 7,000 years. But again, it's the, it's the interplay between archaeological traditions and the bodies of knowledge represented in indigenous and oral traditions when they work and they come together that the, the are most interest here. And um, uh, Martin Dale and Marsden's classic work on the Shimshian, trying to understand the mobility of populations and movement in this area is a really nice exemplar of that. So we have these different sources of evidence and the, the best kind of the best kind of practice, our best knowledge of the deep time past comes when we bring these together in different ways. And this means that we can think about how hunter-gatherer archaeology is characterized in different regions. 
So for example, if we were to think about Australia, arguably all five of those sources of evidence are, are, are used, they're perhaps not fully equally, but they're all there and present. Material culture and archaeology, genetics, linguistics, ethno-historical sources, and indigenous oral traditions. They're all brought together in the study of the past. Now, Australian archaeology is not perfect. It has many, many challenges, and it has lots of things to develop. But at least it has all of those, all of those traditions there. In contrast, in Europe, and that's the, that's the image at the top right here, we have no, none to speak of in terms of indigenous oral traditions or ethno-historical sources for reconstruction of the hunter-gatherer past and virtually no linguistic evidence. There's a little bit brought into play sometimes, but it's far from being mainstream. And we're left basically with using material culture and genetics. If we were to look in Siberia, for example, um, in Siberia, there's increasing use of ethno-historical sources and linguistics, as well as genetics and material culture. But I think indigenous archaeology and oral tradition is much is developed to a much lesser extent in this area. So I think again, that's a that's a distinctive tradition than we might think of in terms of the in terms of in comparison to the Australian. And if we were to turn our attention to the archaeology of pre-sapiens populations, I think we're left in a situation where all we're dealing with, again, is material culture and, and genetics. It's a, it's a model that actually looks quite close to the European model. And, and I think that one of the values of this, and I said at the start, the, the, the archaeology I practiced of hunter-gatherers in Europe, I realized it was quite strange in terms of a global perspective. One of the things that this diagram makes clear to me is that the archaeology of hunter-gatherer populations in Europe is impoverished compared to the archaeology of hunter-gatherer populations in different areas. Okay, so the third of the prisms I wanted to look at was the, uh, was the materials that we excavated, was to see whether there's something distinctive about the archaeological record characteristic of hunter-gatherer groups. And here it's worth confronting a stereotype straight off. There, there is a stereotype which says that archaeologists who like hunter-gatherers like excavating um, sites with very, very tiny stone tools and are obsessed with recording these to the highest level of detail possible and, and using this for their reconstruction of um, past social realities. And, and I recognize aspects of this. This is uh, one of my favorite field projects I've done, um, an excavation of a tiny, tiny hunter-gatherer campsite high up in the mountains of Scotland. The average size of artifact we recovered here was eight millimeters in maximum length. So I, I recognize the stereotype that we're obsessed by, obsessed by stone tools. But of, but of course it is um, a stereotype and we need to think about this much more broadly. And it's worth again asking this question, are there forms of material or aspects that characterize our material that are distinctive of hunter-gatherer archeology? span Okay, it's a it's another overlapping diagram, and I realise staring at this that I've got a spelling mistake on it on it as well. But if you if you look at the literature, there's a series of of themes which are often raised in terms of of defining hunter gatherer archaeology um, material culture. So th this is that the material is old and connected to this that it might be that might be taphonomically altered, and then a series of discussions which suggest that there's a limited range of material culture present. Often I'd either because there's argued to be a lack of hierarchy in these societies and therefore a limited diversity or a lack of mobility in, oh sorry, a high degree of mobility in these societies and therefore that they didn't have very much material culture. And again, it's, it's worth just, just unpacking this. So hunter-gatherer archeology span is, is old archeology. span Yes, hunter-gatherer archeology span and that archeology span of sapiens can be very, very old. If we're talking about human dispersals from Africa or first colonization, we're talking about periods of perhaps hundreds of thousands of years, but certainly tens of thousands of years. So some of this archeology span is very old, but many agricultural societies are, are also very old. If we take Southwest Asia as an example, depending exactly on your definitions and when you want to draw these boundaries, agriculture has probably been present from at least nine or 10,000 years ago. And in many areas, the archeology span of hunter-gatherers that we practice is much more recent than this. So it's not, it's not simple enough to say that hunter-gatherer archeology span is old archeology. span What's perhaps more interesting is that I think and this is, it'd be interesting perhaps to pick up on this in discussion. In most regions, hunter-gatherer archeology span is the oldest archeology span in that region. And I think that relationship, which has, which has key links in terms of taphonomy, 
as well. That idea that hunter-gatherer archaeology is often the oldest in any given region, I think that ties to discussions around origins and is something that, that, might, that, that might repay a little bit more attention. Hunter-gatherer archaeology, and this is connected to the age, hunter-gatherer archaeology is, is also quite taphonomically altered. And this obviously operates at both site and, and landscape levels. And the, the best kinds of hunter-gatherer archaeology have a, a significant history of integration with geoarchaeology and paleolandscape reconstruction. We're, we're pretty good most of the time at recognizing that lots of our data is substantially time averaged and modifying our questions in ways that are appropriate to the nature of that data. Now, these, these questions about the influence of time on our data, issues around time perspectivism, if you want to use that type of label, th these issues aren't exclusive to hunter-gatherer archaeology, but I think the, the responses to them are, are particularly well developed there, which is also, I think, a polite way of saying that I'm not always convinced they're very well developed in the archaeology of more recent periods. But this influence of time on our data is very significant. In, in terms of the of the absence of material culture, there's there's a couple of themes here. As I said, people talk about the lack of hierarchy in hunter-gatherer societies and the and the high degree of of mobility. And of course, here again, these aren't exclusive characteristics of hunter-gatherers. In terms of hierarchy, we, without begging any questions about what the nature of hunter-gatherer social organisation was in deep time and whether this was egalitarian or not, it's clear that hunter-gatherer social organisation is incredibly varied over time and space and includes a great deal of non-egalitarian examples and there are there are regions where hunter-gatherer research such as the pacific northwest for example there are regions where pacific northwest of america there are regions where hunter-gatherer research is dominated by questions of the development of inequality and again hunter-gatherers or some hunter-gatherers are characterized by high degrees of mobility but there are many other communities who are highly mobile as well Pastoral communities would be one example of this, or if we're thinking about communities um, characterized by different forms of mobility, perhaps also considering the increasing, uh, increasing amount of archaeologies of the homeless that are practiced as well. So mobility is not, is not a distinctive characteristic. And in any case, this supposed limited range of material culture is simply not true. And this is just a, a couple of quick grabs of images from the University of Aberdeen's um, wonderful excavations um, at Nunalek in collaboration um, with the Yupik um, Eskimo village of Quinnahag. And, and just a, a range of brilliant objects here, but the one that always gets me is the, is the one at the top, which is a, a wooden kayak rib from about 400 years ago. And the little marks you can see running across there are the, the teeth marks of the maker who was bending the rib into place. But the hunter-gatherer archaeology can be enormously rich in terms of its material culture. Okay, so the fourth of the prisms. If it, Having reviewed these first ones and been, been skeptical of their ability to provide unity, the, the fourth of these prisms says, are there distinctive questions or approaches characteristic of hunter-gatherer archaeology, different theoretical um, approaches overall. And again, some of the overarching reviews um, highlight important themes in the archaeology of hunter-gatherer. So Anna Prentice, for example, in the, in the review I mentioned earlier, she talks about hunter-gatherer archaeology increasingly being concerned about landscapes and about gender. And, and that's true, but that, that's also true of all archaeology. That's not distinctive to our field. Okay, so to, to, to think through these, these suggestions again. So there's often, in, in mo many accounts, and it's a fairly widespread idea, hunter-gatherer archaeology is perceived as having a very specific form of methodological challenges associated with understanding social relations in the past. And this, again, is often tied to this idea of the, the supposedly restricted range of material culture, the, the averaging effects of time and taphonomy. On our data, and it, and it really harks back to the to the profound influence of the ladder of in, profound influence of the ladder of inference. Those are tricky words to say in, in quick succession. The profound influence of the ladder of inference on our understandings, where we where we feel that subsistence is something we are we are reasonably grounded in in discussing, and anything beyond that is much harder to engage with. And, and as I indicated earlier, I think what often happens with this is that having identified subsistence, many of the, the more social aspects of the past that then appear for a series of implicit normative analogies. And I think this, this pessimism 
about our ability to to understand the social worlds of the past is is profoundly unfortunate and this in in some ways harks back to that, that ethical space i mentioned at the start and and uh, a, 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 a increasing conviction i have in my practice that if i'm to do archaeology in a way that i'm i'm comfortable with it must be the the humanity of people in the past that I seek to understand, that I must therefore seek to understand the, the social worlds that they live in. And there is a huge range of enormously creative work being undertaken to try and understand the social aspects of, of hunter-gatherer lives in, in the deep past, looking at human-animal relations, looking at the use of sound as different ways of providing a point of entry for people's understanding and engagement with the, with the period. And, 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 and these different creative, exciting forms can be hugely influential and popular. And it, it's a non-sapiens example, but you just have to look at the phenomenal success of Becky Rag Sykes' books, Kindred, to see how much of an appetite there is for these different understandings. So I, I, I think that the pessimism is really unfortunate around this because this is a, a compelling requirement for us to try and to try and undertake this kind of analysis. The, the second possible common theme is the is the strong influence of evolutionary perspectives on on hunter gatherer archaeology, and, and in particular here I'm talking about the the influence of ideas based around human behavioural ecology. Um, and and this isn't exclusively a hunter gatherer thing. Um, HBE, for example, has been has been quite influential around discussions around the adoption of agriculture, but it's it's much less common to find that expressed in medieval archaeology, for example. Now someone's going to cite an example of this at me, and I'll fall down about this but I think I stand by stand by my general point um, and the 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 use of um, HBE and other evolutionary um, approaches in trying to understand the, the worlds of hunter-gatherers in the past has obviously been the focus of lots and lots of discussion over time and particularly discussion around whether it's appropriate or not to introduce a, a rational economic actor into the deep time past and how we balance out the, the the benefits of simplification and reductionist models with trying to understand the, those complex worlds um, in in deep time and a, and a number of people uh, Martin Poor in, in recent papers amongst others has been very strident in suggesting that this imposing a modern economic rationality back into the past is in itself another act of colonialism that it's imposing these different mindsets into deep time and, and therefore we should be incredibly cautious about trying to do this and again in, in terms of this idea about creating an ethical space and thinking through the implications of how we how we carry out our our work i, I think martin's um, martin's warnings for us there are very important Another key theme which is often highlighted in terms of hunter-gatherer archaeology is that hunter-gatherer archaeologists, the study of hunter-gatherers is looking at the origins of key traits, be that the origins of inequality, the origins of a gendered division of labor, the origins of religion or, or symbolic thought. There's lots of different examples. But, but of course, hunter-gatherer archaeology isn't the only kind of archaeology which is interested in origins. The, the archaeology of the medieval period, for example, often examines and looks at the origins of capitalism. So this origins of key traits isn't, isn't exclusive. But I think what's, what's perhaps more, more relevant is that many of the traits which are, are discussed in the context of hunter-gatherers uh, are often considered to be fundamentals to human nature, fundamentals to the types of societies that humans are capable of producing. And, and with this, of course, we're, we're looping back round to those ideas about hunter-gatherers and their kind of, their, their mythopoetic status in modern thought as a, as a source of origins. The, the final, perhaps area of distinctive practice is the one that's developed most as I as I've tried to, to put this argument together over time. And this is that amongst many practitioners of hunter-gatherer archaeology, there's an increasing awareness of the need to decolonize our practices, to, to develop better forms of practices and to be to be self-critical about the approaches that we that we bring. And I just want to, to look at this in a little bit more detail. So, and here we're in, in some ways, we're back to the distinction of areas where we have uh, uh, archaeology of hunter-gatherers being carried out in colonized nations, as opposed to those that may have been colonizing 
nations. And obviously, in 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 many areas, we've seen the the really important development of indigenous archaeology and the um, remarkable enriching of archaeological practice that, that's happened through that. And I just give one example um, here. It, it happened to be a, a very recent example when I was first putting this together. And this is um, uh, David Bruno et al's uh, work um, revisiting the excavation of Clogs Cave in Southeast Australia. So this was excavated 50 years ago and interpreted very much uh, according to the kind of functional models um, at, the, at the time. And then the, the, the team went back working with the local community in order to, 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 re, to reanalyze the cave itself. And it's a, it's a really fascinating um, account where they, using the, the local community's understanding of, of what lived in caves and the way in which caves were used and caves were places of magic. They were quite restricted places. They were never places that people would settle. But informed by this understanding, they were actually able to identify evidence of these magical and ritualistic practices in the caves themselves. So, so a nice example of bringing together these, these different traditions and, and completely different than the original interpretation from 50 years ago. So the, the Guna Kurnai worldview is making a very, very substantive change to, to how the archaeologists made sense of this material. And this, this bringing together of different epistemological frames, this different, these different forms of collaborating is widely recognized that they unsettle our approaches and that unsettling is itself really, really beneficial. One of the areas I've become much more concerned about lately, and I, I don't have the answers to this at all, it's, it's just it's a nag at the back of my mind that I, I can't lose at the moment, is the way in which our practices in, in areas where there isn't an indigenous hunting and gathering community, the way in which our practices may be doing violence to those communities. And, and I think in a European context, we often run the risk of doing this for our use of analogies. And it's very, very commonplace, particularly in Mesolithic archaeology, but in, in other forms of hunter-gatherer archaeology as well, to make a series of analogies to other hunting and gathering groups from across the world. Sometimes this is explicit. More often than not, it, it's fairly implicit. And, and many of these are associated with trying to argue for, for things like a broadly animist worldview or whatever, whatever thing it might be. But there's, I think there's a couple of issues we really need to be careful about this and critiques of this kind of abuse of indigenous knowledge. One is that we, we run a very significant risk of creating a unified hunter-gatherer worldview, that all hunter-gatherers view the world in a similar kind of way. And the second is that, that we also run a risk of flattening these indigenous worldviews, that we, we remove them from their local and grounded context and make them a, a kind of universal comparanda of, of some kind. And um, rather than perhaps understanding the, the really radical alternative forms of knowledge that, that, these, that these propose. And I think there's, a, there's an important conversation needed in Europe about the ethics of the way in which our analogies are used in the construction of comparative frameworks. We've, we've looked at the more epistemological side of this and how we can justify analogies, but I think there's a big issue around ethics there as well. And as I say, I'm, I, I don't quite have the words right for this one yet, so my apologies if, if that's not wholly clear. Okay, you'll be relieved that I'm heading towards the close of all of this. So returning to those four prisms, trying to understand is there something distinctive about hunter-gatherer archaeology? I think I, I hope to have shown you that I don't think there's any unity from any of those prisms. Either the idea of hunter-gatherers, the way we practice hunter-gatherer archaeology, the types of materials we we'll deal with, or simply the questions that, that we look at. And I think perhaps the, the best we can hope for within this is that there are, there are partially shared features, that there's common ground that we might different practitioners in different places might be able to find enough common ground to find points of connection and points of conversation. So that, that partially shared features is, I think, important. OK, so is there such a thing as hunter-gatherer archaeology? Maybe. Maybe it's there in terms of, of partially shared um, features. But, but how might we then justify continuing to to use this term? How might we justify this, this response? And, and I think 
And given all the problems I've laid out here, and I think the, the most obvious and important point to make here is that in terms of answering this question and in terms of justifying this, it, it all depends on where you're asking the question from and what it is that you're seeking to do with the question itself. P positionality, for once, or for want of a better word, or, or as Kelly had it, yeah, you know, it's a heuristic, it's a pedagogic device. How does this help you think? And I want to highlight two aspects of this in terms of justifying why I think we can, con I can, sorry, I shouldn't say we, I can continue to, to use this. The first is that by acknowledging the common ground that comes from our partially shared features, we enable communities of researchers to, to come together. And these communities both support and challenge our thinkings. And the obvious example for, for me here is in terms of Ishka and Chags and the, the fantastic, this op fantastic opportunities this provides, particularly for early stage researchers to make really meaningful and important connections across disciplines and across geographies and really through this um, challenge their ways of thinking. And as I said at the very start of this, th this paper is in large part a result of the challenges that, that Ishka and Chags have made to me. And I think there's, there's huge value in these communities. And it's one of the reasons why I'm so determined that we will host Chags as an in-person conference in Dublin next year because great as it is to speak to you all on zoom and i and i look forward to discussion it, it's not the same as being able to have an in-person conference and discussion it doesn't create communities in in quite the same way but but i think the one justification for saying there's such a thing as hunter-gatherer archaeology are those communities in the particular context in which i work I, I think another reason for justifying this term is the is the very significant public interest in the idea of hunter-gatherers. Um, and uh, a, a paper that's under review at the moment by Noah Lavi, Alice Rudge, and myself, we've argued that in a variety of areas of um, modern discourse, we've looked at um, health and well-being, physical health, um, uh, survivalism, and, and um, prepping. Um, in a many of these areas, the, the idea of hunter-gatherers is now in some ways being presented as both the antithesis and the antidote to the ills of the modern world. It's a stereotype which has been, which has been re-articulated to provide this, this, the, the, this way of stepping back from the dangers and the problems of modernity. And, and, and this is a stereotype and it's a, it's a, it's a damaging stereotype in, in many ways. But this public interest in the idea of hunter-gatherers is an enormous opportunity for us working in this field. There is substantial interest in the idea of hunter-gatherers and what they are supposed to tell us about our ancestral way of being, or even, and it's not, it's not a phrase I'd wish to, to wish to use, but our original way of being. So this, this public interest is, a, is an opportunity. And being even more explicit about aspects of this, um, I work in a neoliberal university context where one of the areas in which success of my new programs and success of the things I will do are university metrics such as student numbers. Being able to use uh, a, a concept with significant public power as a way of hooking people in to discussions which are hopefully then much more critical, th 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 there's, there's a justification in and of itself there, I think, if used with, if used with care. And running through all of this, I think, and there's a, it's, a, it's another image, you probably guessed, another image from my, my seven or eight-year-old self um, in here. Running through all of this is the idea that, that having hooked people in and having hopefully been able to, to offer create critical perspectives on some of these ideas, the type of perspectives that run through this paper and the, yes, our, our first intake of students into the new MSc is in September of this year. And the very first seminar they're gonna have is this paper to, to try and think and, and work their way through. Having brought people into this and criticized things, I think we can then turn our attention to trying to be creative and to grow alternatives. And this in part links us to what Mignolo and Walsh describe as one of the aspects of decoloniality and the praxis of decoloniality, that it's not just being critical about the frameworks that we often use, but that this is a, a process, a practice, a project of seeking to create new ideas and new understanding. 
Thomas Whitlock recently offered the, the following definition of a hunter-gatherer um, ethnography, and I'm not going to I'm not going to read through um, all of this, but just to highlight that that what what Thomas is is arguing here is that hunter-gatherers help us think about alternatives, as he says, the, the fact that it enriches the spectrum of possible life ways that humans have been able to bring about. It enriches our attempts to better understand how humans create any environment in the in the first place. And and again, in and this is a comment about ethnography, but I think much of that could also be read for for archaeology. These are these are practices that that hunter gatherer archaeology can help us think of different pasts. It can enrich our understanding of different worlds that humans have lived in, and that therefore, I think, I hope, it can help us think of different futures. And if it doesn't have that capacity to help us think about different futures, we have to ask why on earth we would be bothering carrying it out anyway. So, is there such a thing as hunter-gatherer archaeology? Um, I think there can be, if we're very aware of the, of the limits of the term, and the implications of its uses. And, it, and I recognize that the, the response I have to this is, is very positioned from my own, from my own background and, and will be very different in other places. I think, I hope to have argued and, and shown you that there's no simple unity to the, to the craft of hunter-gatherer archaeology, but there might be some partially shared features that enable communities of researchers to share ideas, methods, and reflections. And, and I think if, if I wanted to sound more fanciful about this, I think in part amongst some practitioners, there's, a, there's some unity from an attitude to the conditions under which we produce knowledge. In, a, in an Anglophone, Northwest European context, the, the idea, the power of the idea of hunter gatherers is such that I think working this concept against the grain is a position I can justify. And I think we, within that hunter gatherer archaeology has to be understood that is a an attempt to understand past hunter-gatherer lives to enrich our understanding of the spectrum of, of what is humanly possible. I think then that, that hunter-gatherer archaeology must be, be self-critical in developing strongly decolonial perspectives to what are often very problematic core concepts, and that hunter-gatherer archaeology has to be global in outlook, and that this is enabled by those transnational communities of researchers. It needs to reach to, to, to it needs to reach out to engage beyond the academy and use that potential interest that's there in order to, to hook people into these discussions. And I think if those conditions are fulfilled, then I can, in the practices, in the context that I work in, I can justify the idea that there's such a thing as hunter-gatherer archaeology. I hope that that exploration of that question has been of, of interest and hopefully of, of use to you. Um, I, I end by saying thank you all very much for your time and that I look forward to seeing many of you in Dublin in June 2022 for JAGS 13, where we can live well together. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. I, th I think that must be the most challenging talk, challenging to the radical anthropology group that sure any, is. anyone has ever delivered. I can't think of anything more directly challenging to quite a good bit of what um, we in RAG have been doing or trying to do. I, I'm gonna, I can see some hands up, Mark Collar for once, so I'll, I'll just stop there, but I, I have quite a few That's things. Right. Yeah. queries I want to make and questions I want to ask. There are also maybe maybe I just before... <laughs> but go with Mark, go with Mark. There's some in the chat as well from Delsha. Well, I was just, just going to say before Mark starts, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted there will be there will be questions. That's that's kind of the point of all of this. And I hope I hope the challenging is good. <laughs> Mark, Mark, you've got your hand up. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Graham. That's very interesting. Um, do you think the answers to the, the question would have been different if you hadn't been in the process of recruiting uh, for a new master's in hunter-gatherer archaeology? Possibly, um, but the and I think that's obviously that's obviously part of of this. the The process of bringing that program together forced me to encounter and engage with with a lot of these issues in in more depth. 
I don't think it's it's quite as instrumental as I want to be able to recruit students and therefore I'm happy just to just to use this term but the 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 trying to work out what I meant by that course and that opportunity is a is a key part of it the 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 other part of that and the other part of the examples I gave is actually the relationship of this question to to Ishka which is a which is a community that I that I greatly value and I've been quite involved with and I want to stay involved with but but Ishka foregrounds this concept of of hunter gatherer research um in a very profound way as well and it's something we've we've discussed in terms of editing the journal in terms of you know, particularly with some of the Amazonian societies and case studies that were being presented there are they hunter gatherers or not and and all of the questions that that that, that raises so the, I, I, I think there's certainly a strong influence from putting that program together in, in how I've developed the paper. I don't know as it's quite as straightforward as if I wasn't running the program, I would have said there wasn't such a thing. Yeah, I mean, I was obviously framing it kind of outrageously, but it, no, I mean, it, but... You, you, you know, you, you do a pretty compelling job of arguing that there isn't such a thing as hunter-gatherer archaeology, I think, across those multiple different prisons. So it, it, it then, I mean, it, it does raise sort of major questions about the under, but not only the, the masters, but also these, these organizations. Yes. Absolutely. And this was the, as I say, giving this paper to the University of Western Australia five, six weeks ago, the, the very polite response from colleagues there was to why on earth are you using this, this term? Now, they didn't seem to have a good alternative. I must admit there wasn't there wasn't a there wasn't and different people had different ideas but the you know the the the, the way in which people recognize the the problems of this term i think is very very different in different contexts yeah okay thank you thank you uh jerome, jerome. Sorry, you chair it, Chris. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to chair it, Jimena. <laughs> Jerome. Hi there. Hi. Wonderful talk, Graham. Thank uh, you, Graham. Really lovely to, to hear your, your thoughts on this. Um, I mean, you know, I think, you know, it's always the risk, uh, and this, I guess, returns a bit to Mark's uh, question. Uh, when you really try and deconstruct something is that it slips through your fingers and you end up with sand underneath your, by your feet. Um, but but I, I mean, I, I think you haven't done that, but you could perhaps have uh, reinforced some of the continuities and, and, and a couple of them I just wanted to mention here. Um, and, and that's the business of this term and, and your response about the Australians, uh, I think is, is very apposite. So, um, you know, it, it's a really standard uh, response when you meet somebody, I mean, after a certain amount of getting to know them, to say, well, what do you do? You know, oh, I'm an anthropologist. Well, actually that does say something about the sort of person I am. And if I respond to you, no, I'm a hedge fund manager, you might have quite a different response to me and you will make all sorts of assumptions about me in response to that. Um, and of course, you know, in, in Africa, it, it's a really common thing for people in, in my experience to understand each other in terms of what they do. Uh, so yes, we're a pastoralist community. We care about our cows, and uh, you know those hunter gatherers over there. Well, you know they're they're just monkeys in the forest, or I mean there are all sorts of different ways that people very much understand other people in terms of what they do, and I think that that's a very natural and normal thing for human beings to do, and is one of the reasons for the enduring fascination, uh, not just. Uh, uh, among you know sort of a, a western audience for this idea of hunter gatherer but right across the world uh, go to malaysia or in thailand the king of thailand uh, you know uh, several kings ago uh, wrote an epic poem about the the uh, the hunter gatherers the manik of thailand and and they became part of the constitutive uh, sort of mythology of thailand and, and there are only a few hundred of them uh, living today as hunter gatherers but still so I think that this is not something that is particularly colonial, white or European. It really is something that's very deeply ingrained in human ways of understanding one another, because what you do really does affect how you grow as a person through your life. 
So I just, uh, you know, want to put in something that, you know, I would counter those Australians. And one of the reasons I think perhaps they don't have a good term is because it simply does matter. And therefore the term is legitimate and is good. Um, the problems, of course, is when you become too rigid in your definition and you you fail to, and those questions you just mentioned, particularly about Amazonian uh, peoples who, who do an awful lot of hunting and gathering or Papua New Guineans, but uh, also cultivate to, you know, plants alongside that. And it's very interesting that many contemporary hunter gatherers in places like Africa, where they were pretty much pure hunter gatherers in the past, are now also starting to do some sort of you know, very small scale uh, management of wild plants, uh, if not cultivation. So um, th those were, were one of the things I wanted to just, you know, just sort of counter against. I mean, maybe you, you, you want to respond there about why hunter-gatherers isn't useful or why the Australians thought that it shouldn't be used. But um, I, I have further comments, of course, but I shouldn't, I don't want to dominate. Um, and, and thank you very much, Ron. They're, they're very useful and, and helpful comments. But I, I suppose in part the it, it's not wholly that I agree with the with the Australian colleague. But in terms of, of trying to understand how uh, how this how this craft, if you like, of, of trying to understand deep time past hunter gatherers is, is carried out, it, those those statements are certainly there. And I I still I've repeatedly used the phrase hunter gatherers in in this presentation. Um, uh, hopefully by the end of this month, I, I would have completed the manuscript of a book called Hunter Gatherer Ireland. I, I'm not quite advocating that we, that we shouldn't be using that term, but I think mm. particularly amongst archeologists, I'm gonna generalize horribly around this. I think foregrounding the problematic of that term is very, very important. Raising the question about what the implications are of of continuing to, to use it and how it does, it, it enables us to make comparisons, but it also limits in terms of comparison. So that was a, it was a balance I, I, I wasn't quite, quite able to deal with um, to, to the way I would have liked in terms of this paper, mainly for, mainly for reasons of length. But I think there is yeah, an, a, an important opportunity for us perhaps to revisit some of those questions. Um, about the overall use of those terms, what what are appropriate sources for, for comparison, and and how we might go forward, and potentially continue to use those terms. I think it I think it's a key debate for Ishka to to have because it's one that keeps on coming up in discussion. So, yeah. uh, does, does that offer some some response? Well, absolutely. To that? No, no, I I get it. I mean, you know, obviously. You've started a master's in hunter-gatherer anthropology. You've uh, archaeology, sorry, and uh, you've titled this paper in terms of hunter-gatherers as well, and, and it makes very good sense. Um, I guess you know. I think a lot of the problems are really due to the sort of colonial, uh, racist, social evolutionary models that were established, sort of in the well, in the late 18th, 19th century, uh, in an effort to justify. Uh, the dominance and domination of so many people uh, by European nations and, and social evolutionary theory. I mean, th there's a, 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 a very good analysis of how that emerged directly in response to the critiques hunter-gatherers were giving of a Renaissance European society, which is, is fascinating. And, 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 you know, Turgot, who developed the idea of progress based on technology, which is, of course, a very popular uh, uh, assumption of archaeologists, um, uh, will, you know, develop the theory precisely in order to, uh, uh, to to offer an alternative justification for continued colonialism, because the moral argument was was moribund. I mean, the way that Europeans lived at the time with the uh, you know the, the uh, divine right of kings, the church and heresy murdering people, poverty and and homelessness and all these things that were just abhorrent to the hunter-gatherers that were being encountered in, in the North American context, um, you know, lost the moral legitimacy. Anyway, so I think that those are things which we, we should always be careful about distinguishing between, but that doesn't alter the fact that hunter-gatherers, of course, are what human beings did as a mode of livelihood for the majority of our history. And, and therefore they have a lot to say about origins. They have a lot to say about the way that uh, uh, we became the sorts of people we are today.
in, in all our diversity. Um, I'm sorry, that wasn't a very good question, uh, but it was just you know something I thought is important to, to really distinguish between clearly you know the, the difference between understanding our history as hunter gatherers and understanding social evolutionary constructions of, of uh, you know which are completely uh, ridiculous of course uh, and, and outrageous on many levels. And, and it wouldn't have been and, and thanks for the for the comment which is useful. It, it wasn't my intention to to imply that studying hunter gatherers today doesn't inform us about potential forms of social organization in the, mm. in the past. I think mean, if I if I had turned up to this particular group to make that argument, I would, <laughs> I would have needed it to be even further away than Ireland. <laughs> but, but it, you know, I, so th th it, if I implied that, that wasn't that wasn't my intention in terms of the, in terms mm. of the argument. But, but uh, again, I think th there are a series of assumptions that are made around that relationship that, again, can can be unpicked and can be examined in more critical detail to strengthen the influences that are made. Absolutely, yes. Thank you. Chris, Alicia has a question, then Dasha. Okay, yeah, great. And then we, we can talk. Okay. Um, Alicia. 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 Can't hear you, Alicia. Alicia, unmute. Hello, oh, interesting talk, Graham. Sorry about that. Um, uh, I was curious. You mentioned analogies, and I'm. It's. I know that there are actually analogies in homology. So, so what are you going to do? Are you going to say only analogies by saying analogies, and if you by default because you never neglected to say homologies, you've just sort of thrown them out with the baby with the bathwater. When in, in reality, if you're looking at um, hunter gatherers, I should sort of um, preface this by the fact that. I'm actually an archaeologist and an ethnohistorian that homologies are actually particularly good if you're looking at a specific group of people and you're not making broad ranging arguments over a wide group. So are you what what's your view? Are you chucking them out or you're just keeping analogies? No, no. The I, I think the um, the my concern in, in talking about the, the way in which people are using analogies tended to be the way that you have a a kind of development of a of a very generic hunter gatherer way of understanding that hunter gatherers are all animists. So you were drawing comparative materials from across a from a broad geographical region, and there's lots of discussions about the appropriate basis for grounding um, analogies in terms of how you might better support those in developing an argument. But I think a, a lot of the time in current practice that isn't really happening. You almost have analogies being brought in by by sub. I'm going to I'm going to talk to you about how hunter gatherers understand the world. I'm not making an analogy. I'm just saying how hunter gatherers understand the world. And now I'm going to present you with my archaeological material. And of course, the the reader makes the makes the point and the, and the connection. So I think a a much more explicit discussion about the way in which we make those comparisons, be it for analogy and homology. I think that's what's required, rather than necessarily getting rid of any one of them, because. Analogy is fundamental to how archaeologists think. We can't oh, get rid of analogy. It, it's yeah. absolute. Well, it's probably fundamental to all cognition. It's not just an archaeological thing. <laughs> but again, it, it's, yes. it's yes. having that. It's having that more explicit awareness of the implications of our of our knowledge production around that. Does that does that answer that question? Uh, so so, but because I think I think I think sometimes you actually have to make it clear. You have to say here's the analogies for the sort of the larger to to connect the group that you're dealing with with the larger sort of global, and you have to have homologies because um, I was talking to a couple of hunter gatherers before this, and they and we're working on a project and they are uh, a particular sort of thing, and they're saying, well, we have to have and, that, and homologies too, well, it, we have to have both. We can't just have one, because if we're going to talk to the, the outside world, as in not their world, we want to be able to explain two things. So I, I can understand where you're coming from, but I think it's important. If uh, you're an archeologist involved in this thing, you don't just present it from the, for the global level, but for the local level. Otherwise, the local level are going to say, don't like those archeologists. And what's very interesting is that they actually do comment on the archaeologists who are practicing now and on other archaeologists. And they'll talk about 
why are they thinking like that? Why did they do that? And they'll look at the different paradigms that are happening. So I think we do need, we have to have homologies and we've got to say they are there and they're part of past and give them equivalence. So I, I take your point, but I think they've got to be there. We've got to be explicit as an archeologist, if I put my archeology span hat on, I, I have to be explicit, be very explicit and say to my archeology span colleagues, these are the homologies and these are the analogies. And say, yes, it's, it's complicated, but that's just what we have to do. Because that's part of being a bit of recognizing that there are indigenous people and they have, they have evidence as well, which might not be, in, we might not say it's our evidence, but it is evidence and it's different types of evidence. So we've got still essentially two different classical theory systems at the same time. Yeah. Thank you. I think, yeah, I, I wholly support the idea around the you know, bringing in both analogy and homology. I suppose the, the other interesting point there from, from my point of view, and I should have made this clear in, in terms of the introduction, is I, I've never worked in a framework where I've been working with indigenous communities. That's not been part of my archaeological practice working on the Mesolithic of Britain and Ireland. That's a, that's a very limiting part of my understanding. I, you know, I, I, I try and read around that kind of stuff, and I try and engage with it as much as I, as much as I can. But the reality of it is that's, that's book learning, not real learning. And the books don't talk back in quite the same way that others might to, to force a reappraisal. Well, no, I, 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 see your, I see your point of view, but um, I, I had to, as the archaeologist, know what the books say and the, 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 the people. So it's sort of two, I think there's two, you're, I, th I think I'd probably run on two tracks perpetually, realising that there's what the book says and what the field says and realising that it, it, there's the ethno ethnography, there's the genetics and the linguistics, Alicia, we, so to it all comes on. together. Anyway, thank you very much. Uh, Dasha, Dasha. Um, again, microphone. Uh, uh, yeah, it's like that. my video is not working. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so uh, my question was about uh, distinguishing among hunter gatherers. You seem to collapse the complex and the simple, right? The simple being the foragers who don't have many possessions, don't cultivate plants or domesticate animals, and uh, in the complex cultivating and domesticating and more settled. So I'm just wondering if you, um, seems to me it makes a difference for archeology, span you're gonna find more evidence of the complex than the nomadic, uh, just because they don't you know, make a mark on the earth. So shouldn't you be distinguishing? So um, uh, thank you for the question. It wasn't my, wasn't my intention to, to collapse those categories, I think the, it, my point is that hunter gatherers are characterized by an enormous diversity of forms of, of social organization. And we've, we've often tried to capture that by a series of subdivisions, complex or foragers, immediate return, delayed return, but there's a, a much broader spectrum of that, of that variability that's in there. And, and yes, those will, have, those will have create different forms of archeological record, and we need to be very sensitive to, to that. But, but I don't, I, I hope, I, I hadn't I had collapsed that particular division in terms of the analysis I presented. It was, uh, I thought so from some of the conclusions you were drawing, but I, I didn't write them down, so can't be specific, but uh, the, the uh, simple are not gonna be um, hierarchical, but the complex often are, <laughs> for example, right? But- um, I, I, Absolutely, but I, I wouldn't have, I, I, I hope I didn't give the impression that hunting gatherers were either hierarchical or non hierarchical. It's that it's that range of potential forms of organization that is is one of the interesting challenges archaeologically. And and that's without getting into into you know, the questions about what may have been the, the form of let's say Pleistocene social organization, whether that was hierarchical or egalitarian or or flipped and moved um, between those at different times and different places. So, but archaeology will be oriented or biased towards the complex just because they leave evidence, more evidence, right? So it seems to me you have to really be explicit about that. Okay, right. Yeah, I mean, I suppose the, 
there is, there will be different material traces associated with different forms of um, social organisation, and we then need to be aware of the different aware of the implications of that different form of visibility. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Joshua. Has Mark? Have you got another one? And then maybe Rag can have a bit of a go. <laughs> I, I I do. I mean, I, I've got a couple of questions. Go on, you, you go. You're our guest. Go on. I've got a point and a question, I guess. Um, so the point was about the, I guess it was Martin Poor. You highlighted his critique of evolutionary approaches to, to hunter-gatherers. And I just wanted to react to that. So I think he's misunderstanding the point of e evolutionary theory as it's deployed in relation to not just hunter-gatherers, but you know, archaeology in general, and it's it's really not about you know projecting economic man back into the past. I mean, it's about you know it's a, it's <clears throat> theoretically based predictions that you can use to compare the archaeological record to, mm -hmm. and it's at least as interesting when it disagrees when the the record disagrees with the prediction as it is when it agrees. So the, I, I think Martin, I'm not criticizing you, but I think Martin and, and I think archaeologists, you know, he's, he's not uncommon amongst archaeologists in not really understanding what evolutionary researchers are trying to do with, with human behavioral ecology, for example. Mm -hmm. so that's the comment anyway. And, and the, the question, I'm just sort of, um, I guess it follows on from the last question in, in a way um, and sort of you know, speaks to this, um, the, the problematic nature of the, uh, the boundary between hunter-gatherers and other groups. I mean, can, can you imagine, um, you know, w would a, an archeologist who, who works on Northwest coast hunter-gatherers here in, in Vancouver, for example, have, more productive conversations with somebody who works on small scale agricultural societies than he or she would with somebody who works on, I don't know, uh, you know, Pleistocene Europe or Mesolithic uh, Island, let's say. I mean, I, it just, in, in terms of thinking whether this is actually a real area of research as opposed to a, an arbitrary division that seems like an important question to think about. And, and I, I, to me, the, ob the answer seems pretty obvious, but maybe you've got a different, I mean, when you're in engaging with conversations with your colleagues about other hunter gatherers, could you imagine having, you know, um, at least as productive conversations with somebody who works on, on, a, on, on small scale farmers, for example? Absolutely. Take the to take the particular example you're given there. Someone working on you know, complex hunter gatherers to, to use that phrase in Vancouver, who they might have a productive conversation with. I think in part it would depend exactly what they wanted to have a conversation about, which which aspect of those. Mm -hmm. uh, but but I don't doubt for a second that many of those productive conversations might be with small scale horticulturalists, small scale agriculturists, rather than. That folk in, you know, perhaps in Pleistocene or even the early Holocene of Europe, and the, the the one of the risks of of reiterating the idea that there is such a thing as hunter-gatherer archaeology is it encourages people to have one sort of conversation rather than the other kind of conversation. That it, it, it puts people in a particular direction in terms of the comparison that they make. And I I suppose I I hope that one of the things if there is value in this, in the reflection that's in this paper, it might be in opening out those options to, to people and making it perhaps a little bit more explicit what people are doing when they choose to, to have those conversations and make those types of connections. Okay, thank you. Chris, do you want to say anything? You... I certainly do, yes. Um, so... <laughs> you want to defend Sorry? Well... your entire rash. Your entire work, well, life's work here. We are definitely <laughs> very much under threat here. There's no question about it. And I'm, I hope you can see that I'm very, very happy about it all. And it's great to be under threat <laughs> because it forces a response. 
Um, so, um, Graham, you, 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 the, the most powerful <laughs> thing you said, I think, was um, towards the end when you said, why bother? Why bother with any of this? Hunter gatherer research, yeah. archaeology, academic work in, of any kind, if it doesn't help us think about different futures. I mean, that was so well said. And I presume you, you mean not just think about different futures, but to take, try to take some kind of action to make sure that we have a future full stop. Because of course, that, that with, with climate change as it's accelerating now, that, that has actually in, in question, isn't it? Absolutely. Uh, so um, it, I'm just wondering how you, how you feel that your overall conclusions, and I, I, I don't want to oversimplify, but it's kind of, you have these prisms and on every on every level is is like no, I mean no unity, no unity, no common principle, no, nothing nothing that you can glean from all of this except the the, the idea, as far as I can work out, that sort of everything's different uh, wherever you look, and you can't really make a huge amount of simple sense of hunter gatherer research or hunter gatherer archaeology. And I know that's not quite fair because, of course, what you what is so important is that we are honest and we are accurate and we're conscientious and we don't impose ridiculous <laughs> theoretical models on on the world, which you know, which just completely can just actually conceal from all of us what's actually going on in in reality. But I mean, the thing is that you can't. I mean, it's, as you, I think you said in answer in, in answer to to, to Alicia. Uh, you, you, Without analogy, you haven't even got cognition. And I would just go a little bit further. I mean, unless somehow you can derive some kind of conceptual sort of insight, uh, some kind of level of abstraction, which makes sense of what initially seems to be a vastly complicated, massive divergences, I, I don't think, I, I can't quite see that we're even doing science. We're, we're starting out by being very, very honest. Uh, and But surely we need to get to some place where we can begin to make some kind of sense of this, if we think there is a possible future for us, and we are going to use, you know, anthropology and archaeology in order to hopefully get us there, we need some, if, 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 if the standards of measurement you use to, to compare different, say, if you're in, in, looking at architecture in different buildings, if you're using centimeters here and, and furlongs there and feet there, and everything's varied, including your own method, methods of measurement, that we're not quite doing science. And I, I just, I just feel that um, I just feel like you're missing out on something. I mean, we are human beings. We've emerged at a certain point in the planet. We're rather strange creatures. And there's an, a rather a stunning levels of, not commonality, but a sh but like variations on themes, which Camilla wrote about in, 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 in recently when she talked about a source cosmology for hunters and gatherers. And what I noticed in your presentation was precisely the areas where you can find those commonalities there's absolutely no mention. I know Kim is saying shut up <laughs> quickly. Okay, but I mean, there's not, you said nothing. No, about, I'm saying African. I, don't, I said about, African hunt together, so it's not every hunt together. Well, yeah, but we evolved in Africa. So, I mean, wh why nothing about ochre? Why nothing about moon and sun? I mean, behavioral ecologists are absolutely aware these days with all their night cameras that the moon is a crucial variable, which, and, you know, and nothing about ochre. I mean, this, this, I, I, I'm just thinking about that wonderful French, recent French concept, not that recent, of course, problematique, mm -hmm. where a certain approach, always a cultural approach, just actually makes certain questions almost illegitimate, almost, un 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 you know, you can't, certain questions you can't ask. And it's precisely in the questions you can't ask, it seems to me, about, for example, childcare, about, for example, classificatory forms of kinship, about, for example, menstruation and ovulation, about, for example, the moon and other forms of periodicity, about initiate so many things, undergathers, you know, <laughs> the ideology of blood. So, I mean, these, these things which are, we, in order to even discuss them, we have to break our own culture. That is, that's where we might find some insight. And I just noticed that in your in your in your treatment of, for example, material culture. I mean, no ochre. I mean, just I mean, when, when you're dealing with Aboriginal Australia, of course, massively significant, uh, and so on. So I just, I don't know. I I just feel it is a real challenge. It's great to be challenged, but I'm I, I think if you're interested in making some kind of hunter gatherer archaeology inspiring to people who might want to think about different futures you're actually it's actually been pretty discouraging really and it needn't be thank you chris it wasn't wasn't my intention uh, at all to be to be discouraging I'm sorry if it I'm sorry if it had that if it had that impact or it landed in or it landed in that way the 
I, I suppose I, I agree entirely that we we need some forms of categories to help us make sense of the world, yeah. um, to to make comparisons, to 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 move beyond simply treating each individual person we come across, society we come across, archaeological feature we come across. We we need categories to mm. to bring those together. It, it wasn't my intention to to throw all of those out. Um, and I think in terms of, I, 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 I think and I hope that by questioning why we default to some of these categories, it might help us make more explicit conversations about why we choose to have particular categories, why we, we might choose to emphasize that hunting and gathering, whatever the, whatever the basis of that might be, and I think Jerome made made some points around that in terms of how common it is for, for societies to use subsistence, what people do as a basis. But it, it wasn't my intention that we couldn't do that at, at all. But perhaps a, a suggestion that we might be more explicit about the about why we make particular decisions there, given the the problematics of that of that category. In in terms of why I I didn't discuss. Um, Ochre and didn't discuss the didn't discuss in in terms of material culture and some stuff. Or rock art. Or rock art. I I I wasn't attempting to to discuss every aspect of hunter gathering material culture. Just some of the key things that were that were raised as being as being significant. So there, there's a lot that was missing from from all of that. Camilla's Camilla's shaking her head at this one. No, oh, no, I'm agreeing with you. I I'm defending you from Chris. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll say something afterwards. Oh. Well, I think that that was I think that was more or less what I wanted to say around that. It, it wasn't, as I say, it wasn't an attempt to say we can't ever do this or, or or use these terms. We have to make comparisons, but to to think critically about why we use particular particular frameworks. Yeah. I, I, so uh, if I can chip in. Um, I really appreciate Graham's so careful and thoughtful delineation of the problems and, you know, it's full of salutary warnings and cautions and, and very, very interesting. Um, and in terms of, I think there's a valid point about uh, <laughs> archaeologists in general will get excited about seeing more stuff and more complex, which is a, a, just a horrible designation. Um, you know, stuff. Um, so we have to always be working against that whole, just as Dasha says, working against that whole trajectory that the more stuff people have, the more interesting they are. Mm. Um, I'm reminded of, well, I'm thinking of Hadza material culture and uh, James Woodburn's amazing collections that are in uh, British Museum collections, but especially Thea Schornes, uh, work in on the museum collections of the Hudson and, and looking at, she used a kind of dialectic framework whereby the Hadza is some of the most immediate return mobile hunter-gatherers that classically that there are. Um, if they have material culture that is not utilitarian, then that must be something important. And so she really focused down on what is the material culture that they do carry around. Therefore, that must have great impact, great, great import. And the other aspect of your talk that I think is so important, which again, which Chris has been drawing on and, and saying it is, is you know, these are compelling stories. Yeah, we, we became, hunting and gathering made us human. They gave us our bodies, our minds, our souls. That, that is for sure. Um, and they have done for hundreds of thousands of years compared to the very few thousand years that we've been doing anything else. So, you know, this is a compelling story. But then you get the terrifying kind of, we look at the Capitol riot on, when was it, January the 6th, and there's people dressing themselves up as their imagined, you know, shamans and imagined hunters and gatherers or Neanderthals or whatever it is. It's a, it's a kind of strange aesthetic that's coming from some of the, the, the most crazy white supremacist corners of Aryan and all kinds of stuff. Um, 
but but what you and and Noah and Alice Raj uh, are writing about this antidote antithesis this is really fascinating that if we can't go you know uh, defending Chris now if we can't go back and and really investigate wh wh where was that where did those life histories start where did those um, societies start then we can't counter those crazy stories in some ways we we have some job to provide a narrative that is true to our evolution and true to our bodies and hearts and minds. Um, the, the last point is on the evolutionary perspective, and this is to support Mark, Mark Hurden uh, somewhat more. Um, you know, there's, there's been such a wealth from human behavior ecology of learning and uh, from, you know, by accident, to some extent, learning from hunter-gatherers. And again, we can come back to the Hadza the importance of, for instance, grandmother hypothesis, leading to the importance of collective childcare, coalitionary understanding of the organization of, uh, of hunter-gatherer, the reproduction of hunter-gatherer society. Um, is just, it, it's what's, uh, and Dasha Navais, of course, it, has been doing so much work on this, create this matrix, this evolved nest matrix of, of what made us human. Um, these are, these are just vital questions for us to ask. So having approaches that overcome what Jerome is, is saying is social evolutionary models that are completely discredited, but ones that are really grounded in, in archeology, span in ethno-linguistic -ling historic sources, in the sort of indigenous sources that Alicia is able to draw on for her work, in life history theory, um, understanding you know, uh, you know, these very different pros uh, perspectives of gender narratives, um, quite, quite distinct from, from a Western narratives. I, I think these are all of enormous value. I'm sure you wouldn't deny it. <laughs> no, I, 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 I wouldn't at all. And the, um, the, there's lots to respond to there, Camilla. The, um, the comments about material culture, I, yeah, I, that's just a fascinating point to to understand which aspects of material culture might be e elaborated in different ways. W was that the recent book about Hudson material culture? Is that the, is that the research uh, you're thinking of there? Um, it, it, it has Taya gone to a book? I was thinking of her PhD and whether that's been published. Um, there, there, there was, there was a James book. has them. Yeah, there, there, oh, there, there was a I'm book. I'm not sure. Has, yeah, that no, can't quite recall. But no, that's a, it's a fascinating point and a, you know, struck by a, 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 an example almost in the opposite direction, but thinking about some aspects of Australian architecture, where one of the reasons people argue that that architecture isn't yeah. always very elaborated is that all of the care and attention is going into relationship with the land. That it's, it's understanding that kind yeah. of interplay that, that generates our evidence. And that's why we need incredible sensitivity uh, around our approaches to, to that material. The, I, I take the evolutionary point entirely. Again, it, that wasn't my intention to, to to completely dismiss that. Just to to highlight some aspects of of that concern. The your point about the need for compelling narratives. I think this comes back to to Chris's point as well, and the 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 need to, mm. to counter the the way in which these stereotypes are used. It, I absolutely and wholeheartedly uh, agree. And if the if the idea of, of hunter-gatherer allows us to articulate that, if, if by looking critically at that idea and understanding what is the, the basis that we're using for that assumption, is the basis that it's actually hunter-gatherer as a subsistence strategy? Is the basis that it's hunter-gatherer as a form of sociality? Is it that it's hunter-gatherer because of the importance of sharing? These are, these are all some of the different definitions which are there and, and often overlap in different ways. But to, to use those types of arguments to build a compelling case, a compelling narrative that shows why our evolutionary past can help us imagine different futures. That's that's I think hugely, absolutely hugely important. And I wouldn't be I wouldn't be saying we can't do that at all. I think that's that's part of what Noah Alice and I were were trying to look at is to to gain that sense of the way in which those stereotypes are being articulated not just because it's a dry academic interest to know what stereotypes people are there, but then to, to think about how we can begin to, to deal with that. So no, not, not mm -hmm. saying that we, we can't and we shouldn't be trying to tell compelling narratives, 
even about hunter gatherers but i think at times just being that bit more explicit about what work that category is doing is is important i can see isabel and um and then denise mm -hmm. isabel and Hi, thank you. Actually, um, I wanted to kind of go bit something in between with, with what you, Chris, said and Graham has been saying. What's interesting is I'm going to just focus on the Sudan and archaeology because that's where sort of I'm working at the moment. What emerges looking at Paleolithic sites is that there are very different patterns of mobility, which tells us the important thing that, you know, not all hunter gatherers are the same, but also very interesting choices in material that people use to make their tools, to make whatever. And a lot of that was obscured for a long time and still is to some extent because there's this um, insistence on applying French terminology on African material. So, I mean, I wonder, does it even work for say Ireland or Scotland? Because it certainly doesn't in Sudan. And if I read about another Levalois point, I, I swear I'll scream. But one thing archeology span can really show is that mobility operates in such different ways. And I mean, we see that even, even if we sort of broaden our scope and leave Africa for a minute, the so-called hunting and gathering actually survives for a long time, even in the Neolithic or the so-called Mesolithic. So it depends, I suppose, if we want to just look at it as a subsistence strategy, in which case we can stop in the Paleolithic, or if we look at it as something more broadly, in which case we have to really consider how it evolves over time. So yeah, just in support of Graham, because you know it's often really difficult with these things. And of course, in Sudan, we have the problem that things are constantly lost to say building a dam or the spread of agriculture. So we've got to be really fast with our surveys and things. Anyway, thank you, Graham, that was brilliant. Thank you for the, thank you for the kind words. I, I'll just make one comment about the, some of the terminology in Ireland compared to, to, to the neighboring Ireland. Even in the Mesolithic, it's quite amusing that Ireland can define an early and late Mesolithic, whilst Britain has an early and late Mesolithic. But the early Mesolithic in Ireland is the late Mesolithic in Britain. <laughs> um, the terminology simply simply doesn't align. And you know, at, at the moment, the um, in a series of discussions recently, including some stuff coming out of Britain, talking about the simplification of technology in the Irish Mesolithic and doesn't always sit right to have British people talking about Ireland being simplified, especially when it tends to be buttressed by analogies drawn from Tasmania. And there's a whole series of, of arguments that kind of spin around this. So there are there are really important things to try and to try and unpick around that. The the, the comment again about you know when does subsistence stop being hunting and gathering and using the other definition. I, I do think there's an issue. In, in anthropology, there's, I think, good nuance around these different types of definitions and how definitions of hunter-gatherers have changed over time. I don't think that's as well recognized in archaeological practice. And I think the definitions still tend to be dominated by subsistence first. And that that's, a, that's a problem. Denise? Well, I was just going to say that uh, it's a pity you didn't mention South America. You did just in passing, but... Um, it's so challenging because you've got hunter-gatherer civilizations, you've got urbanism without cities, you've got sedentary um, civilizations, you've got earthworks that's all over the place that nobody knows really what they're about yet. We've got walkways right across the flooded regions of the Amazon and you've got enormous pools for harvesting fish periodically and you've got plant cultivation but with no need for agriculture because you have constant uh, harvesting so it just presents a very very different picture and uh, and also there's pottery from 7,000 years ago mostly in serving vessels so it, it's all about a social um, set of criteria as opposed to other things and there's even gold production without states or wealth accumulation so it throws the whole thing up in the air. Um, it's not an area I'm very familiar with sounds absolutely fascinating. Um, the, it, it wasn't my intention to try and be to be global in and comprehensive in the in the examples that that were offered there. I mean, aspects of what you what you discussed 
I, I'd be more familiar with the Eurasian material, but you know, in terms of the early adoption of ceramics and stuff like that, we can we can see here in particular types of social contexts as well, some of the metallurgy as well. But the, the examples you're giving, I, I think again, just highlight those issues around diversity of hunting and gathering groups, the the enormous range that we pack into that into that label. I it's an exercise I try with with students, which is to ask them to actually pin down and define hunting gatherers without using any negatives in their definition. And it's a, it's quite a fun exercise for, for people to try and because of that enormous range of forms of, of human social organization that, that are in there with all of the different relationships with other with other places, other plants, other animals, other spirits, all of those things that are bound up in their life. So thank you for the I'll have to go and chase up some reference. South America. Okay, thank you. Could I just perhaps uh, 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 ask a question? Um, just, uh, you said that there's no, I, I think I'm right in saying, I tried to write things down, there's no unified hunter gatherer worldview, uh, which is obviously correct. There's no unified hunter gatherer worldview. Um, but so if I was to say, well, while saying that, I would also say, but it is quite extraordinary how much the hunter-gatherer different worldviews can be viewed as, as transformations and permutations on something rather fundamental at the, at the root. And I just mentioned Alan Testa's concept, the ideology of blood. Um, hunter-gatherers shed blood. Uh, they, they kill animals. And there's, I think, always some kind of relationship to that blood which is more than just technological. And very often it's linked, in obviously in different ways, with, 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 with human blood and, and in particular menstrual blood. So I'm, I'm just saying, would you agree that when we say there's no unified hunter-gatherer worldview, I mean, that's, that, you know, and that's evidently true, shouldn't we also <laughs> accompany those statements with how extraordinary are the, the underlying principles which get modified in countless different ways, but we still seem to tell us that something underneath all those variations is kind of constant at some level. Isn't that of interest? I mean, I, I come from a kind of structuralist background. I was hugely influenced by Claude Lévi-Strauss. And I, I just feel disappointed if you say there's no unified hunter-gatherer worldview and then just leave it there. I, I, I imagine you'd agree with me. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm happy to agree with everything. No, I, I do. And it's not, you, I think you slightly misheard me, Chris, but the, the implication is the same. What I was concerned about was was practices that imply, so the, the use of analogy, the, the way a kind of universal hunter-gatherer worldview was created. That, and, I, and I think there are risks with that. And some of those risks have to do with the, with the scale at which we might anticipate similarity and diversity. Of course, as, as you say, at one level, of course, there's no unified worldview. There'll be lots of variation, but there may also be root similarity yeah. lying, lying behind. And I, and I, I hadn't tried to, to get into an those sorts of things and I think it, it, again it's it, it's a case of thinking about what's the basis for the comparisons we're making asking us to be more explicit and to drill down and to highlight all of those all of those sorts of things I, I've not had very much structure this training it's not an area I'm, I'm very comfortable or, or familiar with but trying to to look at that variation in hunter gatherer worldviews against possible common grounds and those ideas about about taking life and, and blood in different ways, I think are very powerful ones yeah. in those senses. So it, it wasn't my intention to say there is no unified hunter gatherer worldview. I think, again, I'd encourage people to be explicit about yeah. unpacking those levels of similarity and difference. Great, great. Can I say something as Darsha? I just put in the, in the chat a two minute film that just came out on indigenous worldview, which is a, uh, uh, kind of, well, it's just a quick overview. There's uh, dozens of precepts that are in common among indigenous peoples around the world. And I have a book coming out with four arrows on some of them. So I at least watched the film. It's only two minutes. Uh, so I would disagree that there isn't a common worldview. It's, it's sort of the philosophy of life. Robert Redfield, I think I mentioned when I spoke, uh, uh, noted there were two worldviews essentially, right? And uh, anthropologist so i'll stop dominating though <laughs> not, not dominated at all and I, and I look forward to reading the book <laughs>
There's, there's quite a few other questions in the chat. Oh, does Mark want to go again? But anybody in the chat who would want to? Jerome or Mark? Yeah, I'll just go. 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 Um, so I, I think, in, you know, at some level, or one way of, of, of looking at this is, is whether the, the concept of hunter-gatherer archaeology uh, is, is useful, or another way of looking at it is, is the concept of hunter-gatherer archaeology, does its pros outweigh its cons? Uh, do, the, do the benefits of organising archaeology this way outweigh the costs of doing so? And it just strikes me that then it's an empirical question, right? And I, I wonder whether we could actually persuade somebody like the Venegren to fund an experiment. So you could imagine setting up an experiment where you have a, a group of, uh, of hunter-gatherer archaeologists, some, some of whom study um, immediate return system hunter-gatherers, others study complex hunter-gatherers, and a, a group of, of people who, who study small-scale farmers. And you could run... Uh, simultaneous or a, a series of workshops where you combine them in different groups and, and look to see what sort of new ideas emerge over the course of that interaction over the course of those those workshops and that would give us a pretty good idea of, of whether you know the the benefits are outweighing the costs I think be an interesting I bet you could we, we could actually persuade the the Venegren or the Leaky Foundation to do something like that. It would be a sort of neat way of proceeding. A great idea. I'd be delighted to have a conversation with you about how that might yeah how that might happen. But yeah, the part of the point of of this paper, as I said at the start, was I felt this was an interesting question. I didn't expect everyone to agree with the, to agree with the answer um, in particular, but I think it. It is, I hope, a, a point of departure for useful reflection and for further conversation. So, absolutely, that sort of idea sounds like a fascinating one, Mark. Okay. I'll be in contact. Please do. I, I can see lots of people here who I'm sure have got lots to say, but they're not saying it. I can see Gary, I can, I can see Tam Burn, Dean, I can see <laughs> so many people. Uh, is, uh, we've only got five minutes, so... Does I, Jerome want to say anything? Does, does, Jerome want to yeah. does Jerome want to say anything? Yeah, I mean, what... Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm now uh, cooking at the same time as listening because I have my, uh, <laughs> my familial <laughs> obligations to maintain. Um, but what I'd like to ask, there's Leticia Molera Vasquez in the chat who's making some very important and interesting comments. And I would like to invite Leticia, please, is to to uh, to just share them with with the people who are so busy talking they haven't read the chat. <laughs> if that's okay, this is yeah. That's okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm I'm coming at it currently um, from the point of view of somebody who is an anthropologist, and obviously having studied with Camilla and Chris, you know, um, I'm coming from a similar sort of viewpoint as they are, but. I'm currently an indigenous rights activist. So I'm, I'm trying to use my, my platform for that. And I, I was really happy to hear you mention colonization because currently this is a big thing, you know, um, with indigenous peoples all across the world. And one of the, the things that triggers them, basically, I mean, like really triggers them is, is the whole hunter gatherer thing or the whole, Stone Age culture thing, you know, they 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 feel like there's always a correlation made between what we're discussing about the past, about prehistory, um, and them now. So, you know, to understand them or to understand the past, we can look at what they do now, and um, you know, they view themselves as modern as modern as you and I, whether they're using um, what we would consider traditional methods or I mean it is their method you know so the fact that um, uh, anthropologists and archaeologists often um, use um, the term sort of annoys them because like like one of my colleagues who's coy you know she says that 
in South Africa, the powers that be have used that sort of meme, that anthropological meme or cultural meme that they are hunter gatherers, hence, you know, they're not a civilized, hence they could, you know, because they were hunter gatherers, they were traveling around the, you know, their habitat and hence they didn't own the land. So they could just have the land taken away from them. And this is a common theme all over the world with my friends and my mental wife friends, my Haida, well, not as much my Haida friends because they, they were more um, sedentary, but a lot the Lakota people that I work with, a lot of people who were nomadic, but not necessarily considered themselves hunter gatherers. You know, they were pastoral and they hunted and gathered and they had small horticulture and, you know, whatever. Um, but the fact that they, uh, that anthropologists or archaeologists were uh, putting the science at the, you know, maybe unwillingly, that, that wasn't, you know, that was maybe not anybody's, you know, uh, idea, but the powers that be, the colonial powers use this against them. And so now there's a big kickback. And, and, and you mentioned that, which, which for me, I mean, I turned to my husband and I said, ah, he gets it, someone's saying it. Somebody is saying it other than Chris and Camilla and Lionel and us, you know, like somebody else is saying it. Um, it's important to, to, you know, just the fact that you've raised that question, you know, and that you're aware of that for me is, is really important. Thank you. On behalf of all of my Indigenous activist friends, I think that it's important to mention. Um, what we do as scientists is often used um, for nefarious means and um, with our best intentions. So thank you for, for, for mentioning that. That's just a little bit of, of what I had said in, in, the, in the commentary. I, I, I look forward to reading the, the chat properly and, and many thanks for the, for the generous and kind comments. Um, you know, it, it means a lot to, to hope that I'm saying things that are potentially helping understand how these concepts have modern day impacts. I was, I was very struck an American colleague um, at one stage talking about this. Uh, he said he would never dream of calling the communities he worked with hunter gatherers to their faces. It would never be a, a concept which they used in discussion at all for, for lots of the reasons that, that you raised. Yeah. However, that person does present work at ISHCA meetings and is published in the Hunter Gatherer Research Journal. Yeah, I mean, I think it's tricky. People. <laughs> so, you know, there, there's, there's obviously a balance. In, in, yeah. I mean, I, I think I think something that we 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 talk about a lot is that you know you have to ask people what they do. I mean, Jerome mentioned it. You know, you have to ask people what they do, and you have to just believe what they say. That is what you know grounded anthropology should at least should be all about. You know, it's not making our own you know judgment calls, and and I think that becomes tricky nowadays because then you, if you're going to write a paper, you know, <laughs> you can't necessarily write down what they've told you because often with indigenous people it's like an hour-long explanation of what they do and you have to condense that um, and you have to use terminology that other people are going to understand and that's where it becomes tricky and then I have Lakota friend, like friends all over the world that say I can't even articulate it in English or in Spanish the two languages that I use you know because they have their own languages that explain what they do so I think it's just you know it, it's just a it's 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 the quagmire minefield that we all have to sort of navigate, you know, at the moment. I think one of the things that Jerome does, and we've tried to do in RAG, is to is to just get a little bit beyond saying that indigenous people aren't, you know, primitive or under gatherers aren't. Yes, primitive. yes. I mean that needs to be. It's no good just complaining about it. Isn't it? I, one of the things I think Jerome's very successful in doing is turning it right round and saying that just possibly the whole human race has a future. Uh, yeah. Is it possible that we we ha will have a future? But if so, um, hunter gatherers and, and others will, will will have to make fewer social and political and moral changes than than, than many many of us in the West. And so, it, in some in some ways, you could argue that actually they're to, in terms of like whether people are modern or not, they're actually quite a lot more modern than some of the extremely primitive, almost chimpanzee-like behaviour of certain certain people in. In, 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 in Western countries. So, so it's just a pity that message hasn't quite got across, I don't think, to so many activists who are still fighting a kind of defensive battle instead of turning yeah. right, right, right round as they need yes. to. Yes. 
yeah, but that's Absolutely. very, very, I'm really glad you you, you came in, um, Letitia. And thanks for- That's okay, uh, th th thank you. One, one slight problem is that we've, re we've run out of time, unless yeah. we want to extend our time. Have. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I think it's probably right to to let Graham off. He's given us such a fantastic talk and discussion. Yes. I think it's been one of the best of all the RAG discussions. Yes. Um, very challenging for us, obviously, but uh, in all the right ways. Um, so thank you so much. Um, and thank you for all the participants because we've had people from coming from all kinds of directions. Uh, and yeah, the only thing to say is, is next 